All right. So try two classes as far as they go. Um, try two is a lot of info dump. Like there's a lot of stuff to cover. The most difficult class that usually holds people back, I should say the most important class that can hold you back is physiology. Because phys one is a requirement for a ton of other courses. So you have to pass phys one to take phys two, general pathology, systems pathology, like a whole stack of courses after it. Correct. And so typically that's the course that gets a lot of people is phys one. Um, along that as well, gross anatomy can be difficult if you don't spend um, a good amount of time like looking at images and pictures like for you guys if you're in the blend if you're in the the if you're on campus the biggest thing is open lab like be at open lab as much as you like possibly can because that'll help a ton when it comes to exams and stuff the blended program, you guys use a lot of. Um, oh, what's it called? It's like uh, VO. The VR headset. It's 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 attached with the VR headset, but it's like uh, VO dissector. That's what it's called. VO oh, dissector. VH dissector. VH dissector. I think it's VH. VH dissector. Yeah, VH dissector. Um, which VH dissector, they've made a lot of improvements with it as far as like getting the information to the students of how to use it. And you'll, there's a lot of like practice quizzes and stuff with VH dissector to help you get through that course. Cause that's, that's typically what drags <laughs> people's grades down is they don't spend enough time like looking at structures to be able to figure out like how to um like how to identify the structures in a cadaver so those are the two difficult courses for that reason that there's just a ton of information and they're really really important courses and then biochem two, a lot is difficult because mostly because a lot of people put it on the back burner because they have so much other stuff to do with the other courses. So try try to try to very very much is like the weed out trimester. Like if you can get through try to. Um, you're pretty set. Like, there's a good chance that you'll be able to make it through the program. If you get held up a lot in try two, um, even if you, like, if you fail one or one course or two courses or something like that, it's not the end of the world. Like, you can definitely come back and get through the program and do everything. But like, if you really, really struggle in try two and just like cannot get through it, that's kind of when um hopefully somebody sits you down and has a conversation with you of like hey this might not be the best fit um at that point which you know hopefully is not the case for anybody <laughs> but um that's kind of like when you sit down and kind of look at what's going on because a lot of what's in try to that physiology biochemistry anatomy um that's half of part one boards and if you really struggle in those courses you're really going to struggle part one boards and there's a lot of people who struggle with part one boards and if you can't pass board exams getting through the whole program means absolutely nothing so does that answer that question for you yes yeah so i reiterate 
focus on physiology. Make sure you pass physiology. After that, make sure you pass gross anatomy. And then the next back burner course, um, try your best to pass biochem 2. If you fail biochem 2, it's not that big of a deal because it's not much of as much of a, a required course for a lot of your continued classes. Um, what other courses are there? Try twos also, there's there's microbiology. And then what else is there? I think there's one more. Clinical imaging one. Yeah, the clinical imaging courses shouldn't be as bad. They've broken those down pretty, pretty good so that they're a lot more manageable. They're bite-sized they, chunks now. Yeah, they, they used to be, because now you guys have FDI try one, and then you have five, no, five or six clinical imaging courses. Um, I think it's six now. I think you do six clinical imaging courses. Um, which, like, I, I had, we did everything. We had DXI one, two, and three. And that was all. We had FDI and then DXI one, two, and three. So you guys are getting a lot of the information a lot slower and just a little bit more spaced out. So definitely a, a positive um in that in those regards so really uh the big struggle with try two is everything just takes a lot of time like you really just need to dedicate the hours of of couch sitting and watching lectures and reviewing and and going through all that sort of stuff so that's that article i told you about for loan forgiveness it's the psl so Let's take a look at it. Any other questions about try to in general? Any of the specific courses? I know not everybody has this course, but the, like you said, the one course I asked about, um, Evolution. The of Evolution. Of That's very much like a busy work course. Okay. Um, it'll, it'll be annoying, but like, you have to get through it. <laughs> so. I'm actually kind of looking forward to it because there's a crap ton of med, med term in that class. And I'm like, <laughs> I already had all this stuff. This yeah. Year. Yeah. And you'll, you'll, you'll see, um, certain professors, you'll start hearing things through the grapevine about different professors. Um, <clears throat> remember that professors are people too. And how, if you like somebody, you're way more willing to do nice things for that person. Yep. And if you don't like somebody, you're much less likely to bend over backwards to help somebody. So just keep just keep that in mind. So. I learned that with Dr. Sarkar because I was so intimidated with him my my first trimester. But by the time I got started meeting with him, try to for me because you got to use most Aaliyah and Jack. I'm technically a try three. <laughs> In far length of term in the program. <laughs> yeah, I remember you saying something about that. So yeah, I'm a split try three now. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go over. So this is going to be a little bit of the uh, kind of a review stuff. Um, I'm going to go through the questions. I'm not expecting you guys to like know the answers or to answer the questions. Um, I'm going to kind of read through the question, pick out some of the key important words. This is going to be kind of a review from from last week's stuff. I'll pick out some of the, the important words and discuss why those are important. This is um, from Fizz, right? Yeah, for Fizz. OK, sweet. Um, <clears throat> so pick out a couple of like the important things to let you know, like, hey, like this stuff. This kind of stuff is going to be tested, this kind of stuff. I don't know exactly how Dr. Tate does all of his exams and his tests, um, but I do know all of the, like, the material that he's going to cover. And, um, yeah, and also then update. I've been posting more recording videos onto the YouTube channel, making them a little bit shorter, so they're a little bit digest more, like, easier to watch, keeping them, like, 10 to 15 minutes. So that way they're kind of a little bit more broken up and they're going to be organized by weeks. It's like week one, week two, week three, and then like the specific kind of bullet point. Uh, the um, course objectives, 
I mean, that's what that's what I'm I'm basing them off of. So <clears throat> they're a little bit easier to to watch and cover just because um, from what I've heard, Dr. Tate is incredibly like he very much knows his material, uh, but he's not the best lecturer as far as like flowing through the lecture is. So just that's a little bit easier to, you know, um, I would recommend watching those videos before you go to lectures and then pick and piece out, OK, what does he say? Also say in lecture um, that's important or what other stuff does he does he mention that we want to that you want to might want to write down or might add into um, any of the stuff that I've gone over. OK. So looking at this question, we'll start from the top. First ones are going to be about diffusion osmo versus osmosis. Um, and a lot of times you'll see it seen as simple diffusion, simple diffusion, diffusion, kind of the same thing. Um, OK, so what is the main difference between diffusion and osmosis? So diffusion involves the movement of molecules from an area of low concentration to high concentration, while osmosis involves the movement of water molecules across a selected across a selectively permeable membrane. Some of the key points look out here. We always want to look at concentrations specifically. Whenever we look at concentrations, in most cases, things are going to go from high concentration to low concentration because things in the body are naturally lazy. The physiology of the body is naturally lazy and it wants to do the least amount of effort that it possibly can, especially if it's not using energy. So with diffusion, we're going to have movement of molecules, but when, we're not going from low to high. We're going from high concentration to low concentration in most cases. Talk about like simple diffusion is what you'll see, like I said before. Next answer choice. Diffusion involves the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration, while osmosis involves the movement of water molecules from a region of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. This is Perfect. This is this B is going to be the correct answer for this question for two reasons. One, diffusion, movement of molecules. That's what diffusion is. High concentration to low concentration. And the osmosis, we I mentioned this last week specifically. Osmosis is a movement of water. If you ever see the word osmosis, look for movement of water. And this last part, Dr. Tate's most likely going to ask the question something like this and this is where it can get confusing so the water molecules move from a region of low solute concentration to high solute concentration if you remember we talked about um, last week we were talking about the hypertonic hypotonic and isotonic solutions and how in each of these different solutions so for example like hypertonic Hypertonic has lots of stuff mixed into it. So that is our. High concentration. So water comes out of the cell. To try and balance things. Because it's talk about the whole point of physiology is to try and find balance. Hypotonic. Um, has very little mixed into it. So we have a very low concentration. So the inside of the cell inside of the cell is. High concentration. So water goes from low to high. And the cell swells. These right here, hyper. There's another question down below about hyper, hyper, hypo and hypertonic. These guys are always, always, always questions on tests. Always uh, in phys one, you'll see it in. You'll literally see almost very similar ideas as well in systems pathology, in general pathology. Gen path is try three. Systems pathology is try four. Um, you, they add more to it like they'll talk about like when you have certain sicknesses like like if you have blood loss or if you have diarrhea if you have vomiting if you are dehydrated that kind of stuff 
it puts your body into different situations and you'll see, but it's all based off of this hypertonic hypotonic. Um, so he will ask questions about about these guys at some point, promise you. Um, <clears throat> so look at the other answer choices. Again, if at any point you have any questions, feel free to stop. Um, so like ask me to repeat something or dive deeper into something, just let me know. Um, talk about diffusion is a passive process while osmosis is an active process. We remember that whenever we use the word active, that means we use ATP. Specifically, we're going to talk about what's called active transport. Both diffusion, so our passive diffusion, and our osmosis are going to be passive. So they're not going to use any ATP. So no ATP used. Or passive. Um, diffusion occurs only in gases, while osmosis occurs only in liquids. Um, this portion is mostly correct, the osmosis. Um, this is the only time that we're ever going to look at it is with liquids. But diffusion only in gases is wrong because we we see within the body, most of the body is fluid, it's water, and we have diffusion across the membrane. Also, <clears throat> the things that will diffuse, um, that will do simple diffusion, which means that they cross the cell membrane, so cross the cell membrane with no assistance from um, proteins. That's what simple diffusion is. You have a lot of things like you have anything that's like lipid soluble can can cross pretty good. So a lot of our our hormones, um, testosterone, estrogen. Yeah, we talked about that these in um, bio biochem one, those thyroid hormones, all those kind of guys, anything that's lipid soluble, um, as well as to an extent. Water. And then also gases, oxygen, and carbon dioxide being the main ones that we'll look at. So that's why that's wrong. It doesn't all, only just occur in gases. It occurs um, in liquids as well. Which of the following is, let me uh, do one thing really quick. Um, also, a trick for you guys, if you're ever wanting, like if you don't have a good resource for like practice questions and stuff, especially now, I use a lot of like chat GTP where you can literally come in here and type in, like, give me practice questions, give me multiple choice practice questions about action potentials in neurons and it'll feed you questions this is a fantastic way to kind of rather than trying to write a bunch of questions or like practice first resource is like the quizzes and the stuff that your the teacher gives you because that's going to be the way that they're going to write the tests second really good resource is stuff like this and you can also even like copy paste um, chunks of notes so if you write out like if you have a study, if they give you a study guide or something, you can highlight a point, paste it right into here and say, write me 10 multiple choice questions about this. And it'll pop out questions that you can study from. So study to bed, highly recommend. It's much, much more effective way to study than doing other things. Okay. <clears throat> Which of the following is an example of osmosis? A drop of food coloring spreading through a glass of water. Immediately, that's going to be a big no, because when we talk about food coloring, food coloring, when it goes into water, the food coloring is a solute, 
And if it's a solute, something mixed in, that is diffusion. Um, air freshener scenting a room. No, because remember, that doesn't mention anything about water and osmosis is specifically going to deal with liquid. Water moving into a plant root from the soil right there. Water moving. You probably won't get asked a question as can, like simple as this, but that water moving, anything that's like specifically mentioning water, that's going to be what we want. Sugar dissolving in a cup of coffee, again, that dissolving, that spreading out, that, again, that's going to be diffusion because it's talking about a solute. What happens to a red blood cell placed in a hypertonic solution? Um, remember, we talked about the hypertonic solution being it has a bunch of solutes mixed into it and with osmosis. Water moves from low concentration to high. Make sure that you're used to seeing anytime you see these brackets. Brackets means concentration. So if you see anything, I mentioned that in biochem, but it's a good reminder. The brackets mean concentration of something. So like how much of it is mixed into um, water, into a solution. So hyper hypertonic. The high concentration is outside of the cell, so water is going to move outside of the cell, so it is going to shrink. If it's staying the same size, that is what we call isotonic. So the concentration is the same inside and outside the cell. You've probably heard of this as saline solution. Um, Make sure you pay attention to that. That's oft, a lot of times how physiology professors will ask this question is that they'll say like, oh, you use and, and usually there's a specific. Um, measurement of saline. Kristen, do you remember what the specific measurement of saline is that goes into the body? It's like, it's like 0. 0.0 something percent. Let me see. What is the concentration? Is it not like 0. 0.07 or 0. 0.09? I think so. What is the concentration of saline that goes into the body for hydration? It's 0.9%. Yeah. So normal saline is 0.9%. Uh, this means there's 0.9 grams of salt per 100 milliliters of solution or 9 grams per liter. So this is one. Uh, Dr. Tate might have you guys know this. Um, usually if they'll say like, they're using 0.9% saline, which is like they'll either say is isotonic or is equal concentration to those cells that it's being put in. Something along those lines, like they'll add that in there because um, we're not we're not going to be administering administering saline. But that that's the way that he'll kind of ask. You can see those kind of questions asked um, if the cell is swelling. That is a hypotonic solution because again remember hypotonic there's very little on the outside so outside now is low concentration the inside of the cell is high concentration osmosis water moves from low to high um, it bursts this typically is never going to be the answer choice that you want to choose um, the only reason you're going to choose that it bursts if it's an answer choice there is if it specifically says that like um it's put into a pure solution with zero solutes. If there's absolutely zero solutes, the cell has a possibility of bursting. But like I said, typically, I have never seen a test question where this is like the answer choice when it comes to hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. So I would just ignore that one. In which direction do molecules move during diffusion? We already talked about this one. They go from that high concentration to low concentration. Which of the following factors does not affect the rate of diffusion? This has been a question, test question in the past, um, at least for the previous physiology professor. Um, 
from what I understand, he, Dr. Tate has co not copied, but has integrated a lot of her material into the course, um, just like using what was used previously to make it a little bit easier. Um, okay. So this one, temperature, we remember from biochemistry, when we increase temperature, so higher temp leads to more movement. Remember when we talked about entropy, enthalpy, all that kind of good stuff. Same thing here. There's going to be more movement, so more diffusion. The diffusion is going to take place quicker because of the temperature. If it's a higher temperature, if it's a lower temperature, diffusion goes slower. So it's going to affect it. Uh, molecular size. Bigger molecule equals slower diffusion because it has to move more distance. More distance equals slower diffusion. It takes time for it to get all the way to the other side. So in this case, pressure. In most situations, pressure is not going to affect the rate of diffusion. Um, I should say pressure by itself. If temperature is controlled, pressure by itself will not affect the rate of diffusion. What is the driving force for osmosis? In this case, even dif diffusion as well. The concentration gradient. So the differences in concentrations. Um, be very familiar with this word, concentration gradient. There's going to be a ton, especially the first exam. You're going to see this word a lot. So just kind of understand what it means, kind of what it's talking about, really what it what it is. You'll also see um, electrochemical gradient. You'll see both of these guys. The concentration gradient is just the difference of uh, in concentration on either side of a membrane. An electrochemical gradient is same thing. The difference in um, electrical charge on either side of a membrane. These are very, 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 very common things to talk about um, for this course. Which statement best describes facilitated diffusion? So we talked about this again. This is in the material. Keyword is facilitated. To facilitate means to make something happen, to make it uh, more likely to happen, to make it easier to happen. So that means using a protein, specifically a inter, they call them inter membrane protein. Um, <clears throat> looking at our answer choices, it requires energy input from the cell. This is going to be active transport, uh, which can be, uh, which typically is facilitated but not all facilitated diffusion is active transport kind of like the square and a rectangle where all squares are rectangles but not all rectangles are squares that kind of idea there it involves the movement of molecules from region of low concentration to high concentration we already saw that low concentration to high concentration we're going to look at that's if we're talking about water that's osmosis from low concentration to high concentration that's like we use the analogy of pushing a rock up a hill that's kind of what that's doing so that again is active transport and we need atp for that it requires the assistance of transport proteins that is going to be our best answer it's going to be our winner um you can also see you'll either have a transport protein, membrane protein, um, ion channel, any of these kind of words, um, or if you even use any kind of like channel 
protein, anything like that, any of these AKA kind of things are facilitated diffusion. It is faster than simple diffusion. No, it uh, depends on all the different factors and kind of what's going on. So I would argue that simple diffusion is the quickest because it doesn't involve any the use of anything else. <clears throat> what would happen to a plant cell placed in hypotonic solution? Always remember the hypo, hippo. Hippos get real fat. It's going to swell and become purged. That's kind of like rigid, firm. Which of the following is an example of passive transport? So we look at passive transport. Remember, no energy used. This is a little bit of a bad question. Um, just because there's kind of a little bit of. Um, a point you can make, but this is a really good spot to focus in on and say, what's the best answer? A lot of teachers um, will do this. Well, there's technically two correct answers. So let's try and figure out what the best answer is. We know active transport is the opposite of passive transport. So definitely not this one. Facilitated diffusion, we know it uses a protein. We know can be passive or active. So this one, while this is technically correct, you can argue that that's technically correct. It's not the best answer. Osmosis, yes, this is always going to be passive. Um, as it follows concentration from low to high. And then endocytosis. Um, we don't talk much about endocytosis in this course. Um, that was more like cells and tissues. We'll mention it a little bit when we talk about like um, the neuromuscular junction stuff, but typically there is, there is um, some kind of energy expenditure or some kind of change in order to help with endocytosis. Uh, how does the surface area to volume ratio affect the rate of diffusion? This isn't this isn't really a question that he's going to ask. Um, we don't really talk. Do we don't really get into into that material? Okay, <laughs> diffusion osmosis. Any questions, concerns about diffusion osmosis? Not we'll just keep right on rolling. Okay. Again, if at any point, like if anybody's watching this after the fact, or if you guys are rewatching this later on and you do have a question, feel free to shoot me a message or like leave a comment in the video and I that'll that will notify me and I can and I can jump in and, and help. Okay, getting into a little bit more of the passive, a little bit more of the transport kind of stuff, uh, which of the following is an example of passive transport. Um, this is really, really good. It brings up, again, facilitated diffusion can be either the sodium potassium pump. Um, this is 100% active, always active. Remember, remember the sodium potassium pump because that's going to come back over and over and over and over and over again. And I promise you there's going to be test questions about about the sodium potassium pump. One of those test questions is almost always three sodium out of the cell. Two potassium into the cell. This is almost always a test question. I've seen this on like every single test. Um, Physiology as well, another little tidbit talking about like in the beginning why physiology is so important. At the very beginning of physiology, I should say all of the exams in physiology are cumulative. So you don't, it's not like other courses where you finish a chunk of material 
and then you move on and then it loops back in the with the final. A lot of the tests like you'll have exam one, exam two is going to be like 70 percent new material, 30 percent old material. And then exam three is the same thing. It's going to be 60, 70, 70 percent new material, 30 to 40 percent old material. And the final is going to be encompassing pretty much everything. It's going to be I think it was an even 50 50 split for new versus old material for the final exam. So if you and also physiology very much works kind of like a flow chart building off of itself. Give you a quick visual example of what it looks like. Um, like if we start where what we're talking about, we're talking about the membrane stuff right here. The membrane stuff is going to lead us into the different kinds of transport, active, passive, facilitated, diffusion, osmosis. Understanding each of these, each of these are going to lead off, then branch off into two more things. So the sodium potassium ATPase, um, the facilitated fusion is going to go the ion channels. And then we also going to talk about voltage gated channels. Um, actually, I should put that one here ion channel then this splits up into the three different type of ion channels and so on and it's going to keep webbing and building like this so a lot of this stuff here at the very very beginning the active passive facilitated the ion channels all of this stuff is going if you you need to have a solid base understanding of this stuff in order to understand the future material so if you that's what's super, super difficult. If you bomb the first exam in physiology, it's very, very difficult to make it up because this stuff and these concepts continue to, to be seen over and over and over again. And because there's just a ton of material, I say it's, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose from both ends. You try, so what try to is kind of like... Um, it's very doable, but it is it's just a lot of information to take in all at once. So if you fall behind at the beginning like of understanding this kind of stuff, it really comes back to bite you. So those of you who are here right now getting this before the try starts, fantastic. Um, if you're watching this after the fact, good as well. Um, again, with endocytosis and exocytosis, there's going to be a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. This course, we don't really get into the endocytosis and exocytosis, so don't worry about that. So the best answer in this case is going to be facilitated diffusion. Because even though it can be either, it's going to be our best answer for all of them because endocytosis, exocytosis require a whole bunch of extra other steps and they do also require some type of, of energy or other things being activated in order for them to happen. Main difference between passive and active transport. We were to answer this one. Active transport requires energy. Bam. Um, this answer choice C also gives us a good idea where we can change this. So Passive transport moves molecules against the concentration gradient. That is going to be our active transport moves molecules across the concentration gradient. And then our passive transport moves molecules with the concentration gradient. More than likely, this is the way that you're going to see this kind of question. You're going to see a little bit more wordy because for some reason, a lot of physiology professors kind of like biochemistry, like to make things wordier than they need to be. So just be prepared to as long, like make sure when you see long worded questions, especially with the quizzes, take a little bit more time to break down the question and all the answers and make sure that you understand what the words are saying, because that's how they're going to show up on the test. And you want to be able to read them quick and understand them really, really quickly. Uh, facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport that requires the assistance of those transport proteins, other names, remember those ion channels, um, carrier proteins is another name, all that kind of good stuff. 
Sodium potassium pump is an example of active transport is the main answer. Technically, facilitated diffusion is correct. With sodium potassium pump, active transport is going to be the better answer. It's the most common example. So the sodium potassium ATPase, it's another name for the pump, is the most common used answer for the example of active transport. So if you ever see them talking about active transport, 90% of the time in this course, you're going to be talking about the sodium potassium ATPase or the sodium potassium pump. Same thing. How does the sodium potassium pump contribute to maintaining the cell's resting membrane potential? Another very, very important word. Need to know this resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential is. Let me pull up a, an actual definition. The electrical potential difference across the plasma membrane when the cell is in a non excited state. So when the cell is just chilling in neutral, nothing's going on. You look at the difference in the charges. Outside of the cell versus the charges inside of the cell. The difference between them is our resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential is always going to be negative inside of cells, inside of our muscle cells, our nerve cells, our brain cells, all of the cells in our body that's going to have <clears throat> um, resting memory potential. The inside is going to be negative because it has a bunch of amino acids. There is a bunch of potassium on the inside of the cell, which is positive, but that gets outweighed by the highly negative proteins and amino acids that are inside of the cells. OK, I have a question. Yeah, what's up? On this, I feel like this might sound a tiny bit dumb in a sense, but it's. Is the sodium potassium pump like the number one most important thing that occurs for us to be able to live the way we live and our cells to do the things they do? Is that why it's. Other than for like lack of a better term, push so hard. It's on the same level as like the mitochondria. To be completely honest, like because the mitochondria produce the ATP. Without ATP, we get zero movement, zero things happening within the body at all. Without the sodium potassium ATP pump, ATPase, without this pump, we get zero nerve conduction, zero muscular contraction no muscular excitation, like same level of importance. It would literally mean that our entire nervous system and muscle system would not function if we didn't have sodium potassium, the sodium potassium pump working properly. So that's why it is. Yeah, so it's almost like the difference between us and a rock. One of the things, sense. yeah, among among other things, yeah, it's it's really what what allows all of this stuff to function at to, it gives us the the neutral the baseline to allow us to go up or down or to move or to do anything from a resting state so yeah very very important sodium potassium pump very important so that's you, you'll feel like this this gets beat to death because it really does get beat to death all the time. So, um, and just remember, because this is going to be a test question, always it pumps sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell, specifically pumps three sodium ions out of the cell and brings two potassium ions into the cell. Um, when you look at action potentials, and everything with action potentials, 
those um, these numbers make a little bit more sense why it's three and two, but we'll get there when we get there. Uh, which statement best describes the role of transport proteins in facilitated diffusion? They provide energy for the movement of the molecules. No, that's ATP. They increase the rate of diffusion of molecules. They move molecules against the concentration gradient, um, which they can um, if it's active, but also have passive. So might that's a potential answer choice. Maybe might not be the best one. Um, they bind to specific molecules and facilitate their movement across the membrane. That's going to be our our winner. This is important to remember. They are, for the most part, very, very specific for molecules. Like the ones that we that we've talked about so far, like the sodium potassium pump is specific to sodium and potassium. When we get to more of like the channels, we'll see a lot of voltage gated ion channels. You'll see there are specific channels. There are a couple. There's going to be um, voltage gated sodium channels, voltage gated uh, potassium channels, voltage gated calcium channels um, that are specific to these things like they don't let anything but sodium pass through they don't let anything except for potassium pass through they don't let anything except for calcium pass through them and there's also what are called ligand or chemical gated ion channels most commonly you'll see these as acetylcholine these kind of work similar to the G protein coupled receptors that we talked about in Biochem 1, where you have a ligand or a specific chemical that comes down and binds onto the protein. And when it binds onto that protein channel, it causes the channel to open to let things come through. Um, when we talk about action potentials with neurons, again, there are there are specific ligand channels. There are specific sodium, potassium, calcium channels. But then you also have um, cation. They're called ligand gated cation channels, which, if you remember, cations are any of the are the positive ions. And like this is one of the rules where it's not as specific, where it lets sodium, potassium, and calcium through it. So a couple of different rules. And if you watch the, the recorded videos, I go over like the whole step-by-step -step of the action potential, kind of what's happening. Um, sorry, my, my cat's yelling at me. No, we're not going outside. It's dark and storming out tonight. Um, if you go back and you, if you go and watch that video, it goes, I go over specifically what channels open when and why and how, um, in order to get the correct response, these channels, this stuff, and like the specific molecules, these are super, super important for test taking. Because you're going to get a question where it's going to ask something like, let me, this will jump ahead to action potential stuff. So action potential. So this is the action potential of our nerve cell. And I go through this in the whole in the in the recordings. Um, but we have the resting membrane potential. 
of a nervous cell is at negative 70. It's slightly different for different types of cells. You'll want to remember what that one is. So for neurons, it's negative 70. Threshold is about negative 55, negative 60-ish. Um, resting membrane potential is maintained by that sodium potassium pump. And then we have stimulus. And stimulus oftentimes can come from a handful of different sources. It can be mechanical. Like for example, like if you literally press onto your skin, you feel that, you have sensation. So that's mechanoreceptors responding. So when you press and you poke, the mechanoreceptors, the nerves and stuff in your skin, and the receptors that are in your skin, go through a stimulus which causes depolarization to reach threshold. And it goes through this whole process, which follows the nerve all the way up into the spinal cord and up to the proper part of the brain. And then the brain registers it as, hey, somebody's touching this. And that's how we feel. That's how we feel stuff. You can also have a stimulus be from the brain. So you can have the brain sending a signal back down. So like, for example, if I want to wiggle my finger, the brain sends a signal. My frontal cortex is going to light up and it's going to pair with that with my parietal lobe to then get the correct nerve to send the signal along the correct nerve fibers to shoot down my spinal cord, out the spinal nerve root, down the correct, in this case for finger, oh gosh, finger flexion, it's C8 nerve root. In order to do that properly for flexion and extension as well. So that'd be C7 and C8 nerve root at the same time or very, very quickly. And it's going to go down. And this whole process of depolarization, repolarization occurs over and over and over and over and over as it travels down all the way to the nerve until it hits the proper muscles and does what it needs to do with the muscles to tell it to move. That's why, so physiology is super, super cool because physiology really does explain how the body works. Uh, we look at it very, very small and detailed, but these kind of things, like we, this process feels really, really slow, but your body is doing this millions and millions of times constantly. So it's it's super, super cool to kind of put that in perspective. Um, but anyways, um, so you go back, you watch the video, you'll see at different points in time, specific channels open down here when there's the stimulus. Once we hit threshold, voltage gated sodium channels open and specifically the what's called the activation gate of the so voltage gated sodium channels open. So it gets it gets super. The whole point of this was this part gets super nitpicky um but printing or drawing out this exact chart and writing in kind of like um kind of like if you did that with like the krebs cycle with um electron transport chain any of those things drawing it out and showing like the specific path and like what happens when and where and why it's gonna be super super helpful with physiology anytime that they give you a graph like this with a bunch of different steps you really 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 want to write it all out and pinpoint what happens at every single spot and be really obnoxiously specific with it because you'll get a question like you'll see this graph and it'll have the number one right here or maybe like one right here with depolarization and it asks you what is happening at this set during this specific chunk of depolarization and the answer choices like what is happening during depolarization will be the question will be the question and your answer choices are Voltage gated 
uh, specifically let's say the inactivation gate of voltage gated sodium channels are opening the activation gate of voltage gated sodium channels are opening and you can have the, the same thing are closing are closing or you can have depending on how obnoxious the teacher wants to be but you can start to see where like the really really nitpicky things start to make a difference when you get a handful of questions like this so and as you watch the videos you go to go, when we go through tutoring i'll point out the things that tend to be really nitpicky like this so okay we went off on quite a bit of a tangent but that was that's super important i want to make sure that i reiterated all of that okay continuing with active transport the primary function of active transport we've, this is kind of beating the dead horse at this point um to move them from the low concentration to high concentration um, if the if active transport if this was changed to um which this is probably the exact question what is the primary function of sodium potassium atpase i'm going to beat it beat it a little bit as, to death as well just because it's it's asked so much we'd see this guy made to the resting potential of a cell this right here this i promise is a test question almost an exact test question it might be wordier and like have a lot of fluff around it but it's going to be this like exact question uh, how does active transport differ from passive transport in terms of energy requirements active requires atp done which is not a characteristic of active transport movement of molecules against the concentration gradient that is for sure a characteristic requires energy heck yes movement of molecules with the concentration gradient no that one which of the following statements about passive transport is true requires energy input definitely not it moves molecules against the concentration gradient no passive transport goes with the flow it includes facilitated diffusion and osmosis or it is faster than active transport it includes the facilitated diffusion and osmosis are going to be the, the big ones okay any questions about any of the stuff that we've talked about up to this point all right cool go ahead kirsten i said not really not really okay um i think to we're gonna do one more thing that's um just because i didn't do this in the video but i kind of want to the last thing i was talking about how important this is i'm gonna go over like the nitpicky of this that i would want that I want to see you guys. That way, anybody who comes back and watches this can um, can imitate it for their studies, because it is as obnoxious as it is. It's very important, and that way you guys have it and it's kind of done. Uh, let me find a, a less blurry version of it. Give me one sec. I'm going to prep this real quick. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, before I erase this stuff, I'm going to go over this. Um, action potentials. Here's another test question for you guys. Action potentials are all or none, meaning either they happen or they don't. There is no, oh, a small action potential or a medium or a big action potential. No, it's it's they happen or they don't. They're either always going to be this size or there's none at all. OK, that's a test question. It always is. Um, so just make sure you remember that specific phrase. We have a couple different spots. We have that resting membrane potential. We have threshold. Resting membrane potential. We talked already about that definition, how it's that difference um, at rest when it's non excited. Um, between the two different sides of a membrane. Threshold. Thing to know about threshold is um, the point that if reached, an action potential will occur. Um, the threshold will be different in each different type of cell, so, so pay attention to that. Um, where it says rising phase on this, that is going to be depolarization. So cell goes positive. We have the peak. And then we have the falling phase, which is also known as repolarization. Cell goes negative. The point that's down further. Here it's labeled undershoot. Um, they call that hyperpolarization, which means goes more negative than resting membrane potential. All of these just like definition type stuff. You'll they'll the professor will usually pull at least one or two questions from this kind of stuff. You also see overshoot which is the um, the amount the action potential goes above zero millivolts up through here. OK. Let me. Go through this just a little bit, get rid of some of this stuff so we have Room. I'm super OCD when it comes to like lines and and how things are drawn. So forgive me as I make this unnecessarily more perfect than it needs to be. OK. So we're going to start at point one, right there. Point one, resting membrane potential. What's occurring there? Sodium potassium pump is active. Three sodium out, two potassium in. Then we get a stimulus. Get rid of this arrow. We're going to have number two. And this is literally what I would do 
I would write all of these. I printed this out to a full page, like a full nine by 12 piece of paper and print it as big as a piece of paper so that I can write all of this small, like right next to everything. So two stimulus activates sodium pump, sodium channels. Again, these can be mechanical um, or chemical. And it re gets up to threshold. So threshold is going to be number three. Three, when threshold is reached, voltage gated sodium channels open. I'm going to take us down a little bit of a rabbit hole when it comes to our voltage, these voltage gated channels, real quick, because they want us to understand these specific channels a little bit better than other things. Let me. Geology one, this one. Mentioned this earlier about inactivation and activation gates. Sodium channels are kind of like a double gated um, path. Here we go. These are what our sodium channels look like. Where they have a gate on either side. And this and our potassium channels just have a single opening. The voltage gated sodium channels at resting membrane potential and below threshold. Below threshold, the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is open. This is what it looks like at resting membrane potential. OK. So I'm actually going to come over here and add. Onto here. Sodium channel. Voltage gated super tedious, but I promise this is worth it. Voltage gated sodium channel activation gate is closed. Inactivation gate is open. The stimulus happens, threshold is reached, and specifically the activation gate of voltage gated sodium channels open right here at point three. A little side note, we also look at the potassium channels. One thing to really understand is that these are super, the activation gate is super quick to just snap right open and let sodium come rushing in. But the inactivation gate and the potassium gate are pretty slow. So this is kind of where it's going to be your teacher preference. I'm going to go over what I have learned and the way that I know it. Um, if your teacher says anything different, come back to this and add in what your specific professor says. OK. So the activation gate open we're going to add in quickly then 
at the same time, the inactivation, the inactivation gate of voltage gated sodium channels start to slowly close. And the voltage gated potassium channels start to slowly open there at point three. All of this happens as soon as we hit threshold. OK. At four. This again, this is kind of depolarization continues. So depolarization continues. And then finally we hit. The peak right up here. At the peak. The inactivation gate of voltage gated sodium channels. Closes. And the voltage gated potassium channels are open. So as soon as the sodium inactivation gate is closed, the sodium inactivation gate is closed and the potassium gate is open, we get our repolarization. Repolarization occurs. Potassium comes out of the cell rapidly. Now, I'm going to come, come back and add one more definition something that's called permeability so this is how much of a I'll call it a solute or how much of an ion slash molecule or whatever is able to pass through at any given time this is going to be, this, I'm just going to add this in because this is another way that professors will sometimes say this and another way that they'll, though, how they'll word it when they ask test questions. So the stimulus activates the sodium channels. They'll say anytime that the sodium channels open. So here at point two, the cell becomes more permeable to um, sodium. And so that's going to kind of repeat. The cell becomes more permeable to sodium. The cell becomes less permeable to sodium. The cell becomes more permeable to potassium. All that means is just describing in a different way at what points sodium and potassium are ease more easily able to pass across the membrane. Um, the ones that I included here are the for sure ones. Depending on your professor, if he does use this kind of terminology using the permeable, double check um, the permeability of. Of potassium. Based on what the professor says. Just because if you look at 20 different graphs of this whole process, you'll get 20 different 
kind of explanations about what specifically happens at each of these points. The kind of the exactness of it is a little bit skewed, just kind of depending on who wrote the graph and wrote the material. So it just depends on which one the, the professor specifically decides that they like. So very annoying, but it is what it is. Okay, here at seven. Um, let's actually add one more thing in right here first. So seven, as soon as it, we get back down to where our resting membrane potential level is, the voltage gated sodium channels reset. So the best way that I can describe this is these two gates quickly switch places. So it's kind of like <sighs> the inactivation gate is closed on the bottom. The activation gate is still open. As soon as it gets back down to the resting membrane potential threshold, they kind of just snap like that. And they the activation gate closes and the inactivation gate reopens once it gets down to the resting membrane potential. This is super, super important in a second when we talk about something called um, the refractory periods. Now point eight. The The potassium, the voltage gated. I write it out every single time. The voltage gated potassium. I, I encourage you to write it out every single time. Because for memory's sake and for like little nitpicky test question type stuff, you'll be super, super frustrated if you get something like that wrong. Because you'll you'll know it, but you'll just get tripped up. Like, is it ligand gated? Is it voltage gated? Like what? specific channel is it so the voltage gated potassium channels um, are closing slowly finally we reach nine the voltage gated potassium Potassium channels are closed. And then finally, 10. Return to resting memory potential thanks to our sodium potassium ATPase. So this is like the super nitpicky all written down of this last thing i'm going to talk about before we end is something called two things called the refractory periods the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period what this is referring to, the absolute refractory period, is the portion of time where no matter the size of a stimulus, so no matter how much, so for example, how much you poke or push or something happens, no matter the size of the stimulus, no action potential can possibly be generated. And our absolute refractory period, I'm going to put it in red, is as soon as we hit threshold, all the way to where our sodium potassium gates, sorry, our voltage gated sodium channels reset. This is our absolute, just doing this. 
absolute refractory period right there. No matter what happens, there cannot be an action potential that occurs between these two spaces. After that, we'll go green. Relative refractory period. It is very difficult for an action potential to occur but it is possible if there is a big enough stimulus. And that is after that point until we get to our new resting membrane potential. This is our relative refractory period. And that has to do with these voltage, the voltage gated sodium channels until those voltage gated sodium channels get reset. And actually, technically, it should be returned to threshold right here. This is where voltage gated sodium channels return to reset. So actually we should move that number seven just slightly up to threshold. Station. Yeah. So then both of these lines He won't ask you like very super specific like at what exact point does this end and this start, but he'll give you like a rough like like over here, what is this relative refractor period? What is it right here? The absolute refractor period. So this right here. This is the one of the biggest things for your week one material. This all this stuff is going to come back again and again. And understanding all of this is super important for um Exam one, understand if you understand all of this, you'll be in a much, much better spot for the beginning of this class. I just posted that a screenshot of that into the chat window if you want to download it. Um, if you can't see the chat window, just shoot me a message and I'll uh, message you the the screenshot of it. But again. I highly recommend print this out or draw it by hand and write all of this in here in like each of these in, in your own words or however you want to do it, but in each of the different locations, write it all in because this will save you a ton of time. The fact that I can still do all of this essentially by memory should tell you how many times I I wrote this all out. So. <laughs> I, I tutored physiology for a little over two years after I took the course. So I've drawn this more times than I care to count. So, okay, before we wrap up, any last minute questions, concerns, comments, thoughts? Thank you for covering that last image it makes a lot more sense looking at it that way yeah i'm glad um yeah, that was very helpful thank you sweet i appreciate it um as well if you're ever confused go back watch my youtube videos i go back through a lot of this stuff not in this detail but i go through back go through this as well um also for physiology 
if you're ever confused about anything, Ninja Nerd is fantastic for physiology. He has a huge physiology playlist. Admittedly, it's going to take you a bit more time to go through his stuff than my stuff because mine is more pinpoint focused on what you need to know for this specific class. And his is very, very, like, much more broad. But he does a Ninja Nerd on YouTube does a fantastic job of covering a lot of physiology stuff. So if you ever need more additional stuff, check that out. Um, as well, did you guys do you guys think it, is it more helpful to go over stuff kind of in this way, or do you think doing more of like the questions would be better, or a mix? I think a mix like this for understanding it for initial understanding is a huge help. Okay. I'm going to plan for next week. Um, we'll figure out a time, what time works best with y'all's new schedules. And I think next week, now that I've kind of gone over all of this really, really detailed, I'll uh, write up a good chunk of questions, kind of covering all of this. And then maybe we'll review a couple of things right at the start. And then really just hound in on questions about all of this stuff. Um, so that way we, we hit the ground running with material. Sounds uh, good. All right, you guys. Sweet. Thank you so much for coming, for hanging out. Appreciate Thanks. you guys Great. being here. Um, if you need anything, please don't hesitate. Reach out. Um, talk to me. Let me know. And I will see you guys later on. Thank you, Drake. Have a good night. Thank you. You too.